everyone. Welcome to yet another amazing brand new episode of Connecting the Dots. I'm your show host, Navi Jaswal, and we have a, a wonderful um, vegan entrepreneur here today with us, my dear friend, Palak Mehta. Palak, welcome. You're joining us from India. Palak's the founder of Vegan First and founder and CEO of Vegan First, and she's the founder of the Vegan um, India Conference, which is an amazing event that if you don't know about, then you got to find out more about it and, and be there uh, for whenever it's happening in 2022. But we'll dive uh, into all of that and more. Um, Palak, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, me Nivi. And it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm really looking forward to this. Perfect. All right. So let's dive right into it. Um, Palak, tell us, how did you go vegan? <laughs> well, it's been, a, it's been a journey and um, every time I get asked this question and it's never boring, you know, so, um, well, uh, to make it really short, I think when I was in grade 10, uh, my friend, my best friend at the time, ironically, her name, her name was also Palak. So uh, here in India, we have a lot of cultural beliefs uh, about, and we are largely vegetarian or so we are believed uh, to be vegetarian. Uh, it's not something new to us. So uh, once, um, but I'm raised and born and brought up in a Punjabi family in North India, where you know meat is really celebrated and it's seen as this um, sign of health and vitality, which is very unfortunate. But well. I was in grade 10 at the time and we were um, out on a summer vacation and, you know, we, uh, I ordered a, uh, a plate of chicken momos for myself and uh, yeah, and I was, because I've, I've eaten meats by birth, right? So, um, and I, and she asked, and I was ordering two plates, one for me, one for her, when she asked me uh, not to order that plate. She said, hey, you know, uh, order vegetarian for me instead and that was the first time when i realized that uh, i was kind of shocked i was taking aback i said why why are you why are you eating vegetarian food eat properly <laughs> you know we have like um, i'm ordering a piece of delicious momos oh, why would you miss out on chicken momos and that's when she said that no no i've decided to go vegetarian for a month and that was the first time as a child that it hit me that i had the power to choose what i want to put in my mouth I did not even realize until then that I could decide to eat what I wanted to eat. I was shocked because this was a person who has been non-vegetarian with me. We've gone together a lot of times and always eaten non-veg. And suddenly if she could choose to quit a particular food, uh, food group, that was shocking and very revealing at the time. Um, as a child, I used to, you know, whenever we used to get this butter chicken and gravy, it's one of India's most celebrated dishes. So I used to always eat the curry, but leave the leave the meat pieces. So I never really liked it anyway, but you know, I did not know that I had a choice. Now that was one of my earliest, uh, you know, instances when I realized that, hey, I had a choice. But then um, soon after, uh, when I tried to cook meat back then, my folks told me, where will you get your protein? Where are you going to get all your vitamins from? So don't even think about it. And I started eating meat again. Now, life went on and uh, I turned, um, I went dairy free briefly when I, you know, I did not really understand veganism fully back then uh, in college. Um, but then again, you know, and for health reasons, I just thought it's better to avoid dairy. But then um, I, I went back to having dairy. Um, I might have, I think I had quit meat at the time. But again, it was very, you know, it was conditional. I was not very serious as much about it. And then uh, when I, but then I had attended this Reiki session where Dr. N.K. Sharma was talking about the prana and the energy, you know, of things and how you measure them. That's when he explained, he had a fruit in his hand and he said, hey, listen, see, think about the aura this, this fruit might have and think about the aura for dead flesh or dairy. And that's when I quit meat and I quit dairy as well, but I did not uh, know about the ethical reasons. You know, so meat was off my plate. I anyway did not like it. Dairy, it was a little struggle at the time. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago. So um, then a few years later, uh, you know, I met um, Monji, who's a humanitarian. And he started sharing these videos. Uh, you know, he's uh, started sharing these videos of uh, calves getting abandoned and, um, you know, really how how cows are really ill-treated 
now <laughs> I was in a state of shock almost because once you saw when when I saw where my milk is coming from I never realized that you know this was somebody else's body and you know you were violating it basically and their natural human rights or birth rights um then I say human rights I mean rights of beings on earth um so when I realized that I made the connection I instantly decided to go vegan now this was a while back around seven uh, seven years ago seven to eight years ago and it was pretty challenging to go vegan back then in India so um, but how do you unsee something that you have seen you know it's 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 really difficult to go back from there so and uh, and you know he, Mohanji was relentless he wouldn't stop sharing the videos so Every time I would see this, I wanted to share the videos with the whole world, but I felt like a hypocrite. I said, if I'm not doing it, no matter how difficult it is, I have really no right to tell other people about it. And that was it. That was the start. And um, I was here in Pune. I was teaching in a school. I started Googling things. How do I go vegan? And, um, you know, one by one by one, it was a journey. And then finally. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much, you know, and from one Punjabi to another, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, I was told, oh, come on, your hometown is the home of butter chicken, you yeah. know, and uh, so I'm from Ludhiana, by the way, and then, you know, you know, pr probably, you know, how that city works, it's like, uh, people would mock at you if you even said that you're vegan, or that you're not going to have chicken or meat or, you know, eggs or, you know, dairy. And, and even now, you know, whenever I'm back, uh, you know, at home, it's like, are you sure? Are you sure you don't want just one? And, and they'll, you know, try to test your boundaries and, and uh, really sort of check if, you're committed to this or not and and want to understand what are the reasons that you're committed to it is it health is it something else you know do you really feel that sorry for the animals you know i've been asked those questions and and uh it, it's been you know very interesting trying to navigate uh that entire milieu not just within the larger you know uh, subcontinent of uh, south asia but also specifically within the micro culture yeah. of you know <laughs> job. and and this whole thing of it's taken for granted where is your protein going to come from and you know um and, and if you don't eat meat and so on um but tell us about mohanji because it sounds as though he's played a very big role in your life um, in helping you make that connection as you spoke uh, about that. And um, tell us about him. He, it sounds as though he's a, a, humanitarian, is a humanitarian, he's a vegan himself, um, and he may have even uh, you know, inspired the creation of your uh, you know, work. So, so tell yeah. us a little bit about him. Well, you know, um, so when I turned vegan, uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions. And I realized that uh, how do I actually sustain myself in going vegan? And that's when I realized, let's just create. It was so difficult for me to go vegan or, and um, do all of that back in back eight years ago in India. So uh, that was the birth of vegan first. And we decided, hey, let me just make a platform for vegans, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, Moji said, why are you thinking India? Go global, you know? So uh, he was very clear about it from the start. I took his blessing. I said, um, you know, I want to do something here for the animals. And also, um, you know, it's just very difficult to transition to a, a diet or a lifestyle like this. There is dearth of information. So um, he gave me his blessing. And, uh, you know, I consider myself as, I consider him as my spiritual master, although, um, you know, for first, who is Mohanji? It's, it's very difficult to say because he's different people do different, uh, different things to different people, right? So any um, anybody who is at that state is uh, truly like a mirror, you know. So some people I know when they see Mohanji, they see a best friend. Some people see a father. Some people see a guru. Some people see a humanitarian. And he doesn't really stick to a frame. You'll see him walking in jeans one day, and then you know tomorrow in a typical Indian attire and um, he doesn't uh, I mean I've seen people who connect because they connect to Jesus Christ and they connect to uh, Mohanji but some people who connect to Guru Nanak Ji but some people who don't connect to any particular form of God they just believe in uh, higher values like selfless service or humanity so I think um, his main aim is to just bring more and more light to people by helping them realize themselves and that's a tall order <laughs> but um so so that's what you know he says and uh that's that was the whole thing when i met him back in college i was a very different person um i was still me i still always been me all along um I've, 
I'm pretty sure I have a mind of my own. I have my own thoughts. But at the same time, um, you know, the lack of self-acceptance that we have as human beings, we have some basic things which are missing in our own fundamentals. That is, you know, trying to understand who we are or um, are we, uh, the, the concepts that we have, are these concepts, uh, cultural co concepts or are these concepts or expectations from other people or is this truly who we are? So. I think when I was in college, I started questioning, what is my purpose on earth? You know, uh, that was my, I couldn't go to bed. That was as simple as that. It was really difficult. And that's when finally, I, after, you know, one, I think one continuous year of churning, I ended up meeting Mohanji. And, um, you know, since then, it's just been amazing. Um, I definitely feel that it's, there's life before Mohanji and there's life after, because you just get closer to your own consciousness, so to your own inner self, and you just get clarity you know, from within, and that's what he empowers you to do anyway. So he will show you as a mirror. So for me, I think veganism became very important. And I said that I want to start a community for uh, people who want to go vegan. And um, that was the aim. And to also spread awareness. So awareness, alternatives, and support was our aim. And he said, he suggested the name Vegan First. And he said, you know, go bless you. And that was about it. Um, and that's the thing. I mean, it was really tough honestly but i think that's uh, you know and it's not like um you know i had huge funding or i had a lot of support or anything of that but i think uh, that's also where i felt moji's blessing really came handy because um you know you you start really believing in yourself and you start really going through the fire and the process and um any business for that matter if it's mission oriented right um everybody so many times thinks of shutting down when the going gets rough right but at the end of the day um in the beginning in the early years we used to struggle a lot you know now of course it's different and we've grown a lot and we're doing a lot of other things as well but in the early times it was just very difficult because um not just to sustain but to even influence people in the right way right so every time you get disheartened you get disappointed you feel hey should i be even doing this um i was a practicing sculptress and an artist and a teacher and i was doing really well for myself so i was like um, do I still need to go through all of this, you know? Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the question was that, who are we doing it for? Yeah. It's not for me. It's not for success. It's not for my personal ego. It's not for showing, it's not to show business evaluations to investors. It is also not to, um, you know, maybe impress somebody or even at the end of the day for a client or a reader. At the end of the day, this is for animals, you know? So if we, if we stop talking, we just have no alternative. Uh, so, and it was tough, you know, Nevi, because I saw my competitors shut down, all of them in front of me. Uh, when I say competitors, I mean like-minded magazines in the country. We had to figure out ways to survive. We would really criticize sometimes, sometimes we were really admired. Sometimes we had so many emails, we couldn't reply to them. And we always had limited resources in the beginning. Um, I've had investors tell me to my face in the beginning saying, please change your name from vegan first to health first. You know, um, we are very happy to fund this project. And we said, wow. no, that's not the, yeah, yeah, this was the first thing. When uh, when I started on this, because I was, I was not into corporate at all. And this was social entrepreneurship. But I was very clear that I don't want to make it, um, you know, um, I don't want to make it, it uh, an NGO because I want, we wanted to change the narrative. We wanted people to take it more seriously and not just take it as another uh, venture where you just want to donate and it's charity. And if you want to go vegan, uh, you know, there is no if here, like you have to do it. This is a lifestyle. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was the narrative long back. And um, I think oh, that's what Monji's guidance, you know, saying that, no, no, you're doing the right thing. Give me a lot of stability more than anything else. I think that's what was good, great. And um, then honestly, I think it's just that, you know, when you, when you have the right intention and you give it out, even when we took, uh, we did the Vegan India conference, it was the first time that, you know, we opened the gateways. Um, of course, there were some events which had happened on smaller scales here in India, but um, it was, it was, we had an intention and people approached us and it was suddenly that the whole world opened up, you know, to India, the first physical event which happened. It was a very huge jump for us, but that's that's the thing i think it it was not that you know we had it all figured out we we had an intention but um when we started putting the word out the response that came in it was amazing and when you give out yourself to 
a social cause, people themselves come to help you out. Yeah. So that's the whole beginning of Vegan First. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that and and about the you know the impact and the influence that Mohanji's guidance uh, seems to have had on you and your purpose in life. You spoke about how self accept acceptance is really important, and and how that journey was for you for an entire year, and and then you you know you took charge and you said, well, this is what I'm going to do, and 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 you've done it. Um, so you've launched Vegan First, and and you say it's a global publication portal your one-stop solution of going vegan and curate um, all things vegan under one digital platform. Um, and then after the first year that it was an in-event, uh, in-person event, uh, the pandemic hit. And, and then you had to really think about how to pivot. So, so tell us about your journey um, around pivoting and needing to still you know, stay true to your ideals and want to bring this major event to the world, not just to India, and, and to actually choose to go virtual. How is that, how is that like? You know, you won't believe it. The struggle for me, for us, was before the pandemic, not during it or after it. Okay. Because uh, it was during the before the pandemic where we did not get people who were receptive, where we were always, uh, you know, stressed out either, you know, how do we make people more receptive? That was that was that was more painful than anything else. You know, mm -hmm. pandemic. Yes, uh, I think commercially, everybody was, uh, you know, um, facing issues. So that was still OK. That was because we, we knew that this is the way it's figure outable. But we were at our best during the pandemic because people were so receptive. So we were really excited as a team. It was one of the best years for us, uh, readership wise. And we have curated some of the best content at the time. We could influence so many people to actually go vegan at the time. Um, literally thousands and thousands, maybe lakhs of people, you know, at that time were reading our content and they actually have messaged us saying that we have shifted a diet and lifestyle um, during that time. So um, I know that the pandemic was really tough for people, uh, you know, and I know for businesses, so many businesses have actually shut down during this time. But um, our mission was always to help people, you know, choose a conscious lifestyle. And the, the pandemic actually helped us do that because it was really shaking people. Now, when it came to pivoting your strategy, right? So um, we were holding physical events. How do we do it, um, you know, online? Um, so we in 2020 we did not have an event at all because we had actually booked a physical space we had done, done everything I had gone to the extent of training the hotel chef it was one of the best hotels in india and everything but then uh, this happened and this was after waiting for six months so um uh, that was not as disappointing but uh, what was what was more disheartening was the second wave it mm -hmm. hit india in such a massive way such a massive way that um and everybody around was just so depressed. Maybe I did not even care if uh, online uh, conference would have been popular or not, but just to clean the air, we needed to do it. So honestly, we did it at the time because we always wanted, we thought we will be able to pull off an online event, but we're still thinking, hey, should we still go back to that experience? But um, at the time, it, it was just so morose and so um it was really depressing so we said that hey let's just go do an event anyway because you know if we just keep looking in negativity and staring it in the face nothing's gonna change anyway plus we need to uh, spread this awareness and um it was very we had very less time so we organized that event um you know within 30 days uh mostly wow. and in a very small team but we just uh, went ahead and did it anyway uh, because anyway we had to do it but we i mean i personally was very motivated in fact i struggled to even explain it to my team why this event was important because everybody was in different cities in india that time and the second wave has just hit us so um so yeah but but luckily i think um it, it was marvelous. Uh, we still get a lot of feedback. There were a lot of uh, a lot of people went vegan. Businesses were generated. Uh, thanks for showing the stats. We got thousand people to actually attend it seriously back to back. Uh, the event was for all over four days. So <laughs> I think four days was just a celebration, and uh, it just brought so much joy, you know, and meaning. And that was truly the whole aim um to help businesses uh, to help uh, you know uh, open doorways but also to lighten people up yeah exactly and and you know i remember 
um, given some you know personal losses that I've experienced in the pandemic as well, I uh, was there to pick up my mom, you know, when the second wave had just started, and I, I just wanted her to, you know, what I felt was bring her to safety and and you know bring her here to the U.S. Um, and and that wouldn't have been really like the you know port of call for anyone to be uh, back in the first wave because the U.S. got hit pretty hard and and the world was shutting down to us. Um, and and then India did well by you know it, it, um, calling lockdowns and, and so on early on in March. I remember March 22nd or 24th was the first time when India went into a lockdown. Um, but then things started to open up and, well, we had the Delta variant, you know, and, and that really uh, hit India hard. And it, it obviously was a you know, global crisis at that point in time and everyone knew what was going on. Um, and, and having participated in, in your conference, um, you know, uh, Palak, I could definitely sense that there was this, um, you know, urge and uh, almost like this, this energy, this feverish energy in the audience, um, whether they were lifestyle medicine professionals or just, you know, medicine people, like people in the medical profession or healthcare providers in India, or they were uh, students or, or they were just like regular, you know, people, that they just were desperate to understand what can they do for their immunity? And if veganism is the way to build their immunity to somehow, you know, uh, protect them, then they wanted to find out. So it seems like, um, you know, COVID-19 has changed certain health and food behaviors in India. And, uh, you know, if, if I can, you know, and I use those words carefully, but if there can be a silver lining to what the world is going through at this point in time, it's it's the rudest waking wake up call. Uh, mm -hmm. But as long as there is some waking up that is happening, um, you know, especially in a place like India, where population density tends to be a huge problem. And, and that's the one, you know, uh, criteria for this uh, uh, virus to continue to propagate. So tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, what's what's the mood in India at this point in time when uh, when it comes to health oriented behaviors, people wanting to understand more about immunity and how might that have changed the narrative and the dialogue that you guys are interacting with at this point in time with your audiences? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Nivi, you've just got the pulse absolutely right. You know, the thing is, and that's what I said, you know, we, uh, of course, it was really difficult for us uh, as well, the whole 2020, 2019, uh, you know, those years were, were really challenging. But at the same time, you know, we were thriving on creating awareness because of heightened receptivity. And, you know, that was, um, and that's what I still see today. More and more people have so many more. So veganism got a huge push. See, in India, uh, and you, you're an Indian, so uh, you totally understand. Uh, everybody's either a fan of cricket or Bollywood, you know. So Virat Kohli turning vegan was great. Then Akshay Kumar turning vegan. Or, uh, you know, another celebrity going vegan was just epic. And uh, that's what, definitely, that's when we saw, thought, you know, veganism is taking off you know, very very early very nascent stages you know we, we saw the sprouting of something but when after covid happened after that there was just you know there was no 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 ifs and buts anymore so now you do you see vegan options at so many more restaurants you see people not mocking at you anymore and because i think that more than anything else and more than even activism or sensitivity sensitivity towards animals i think preventive health care the yeah. amount of money that has gone into preventive healthcare as an industry, you know, um, has taken uh, a lot of push globally, not just in uh, India for that matter, right? And um, veganism is highly, highly um, renowned in that area. Vegan, uh, a whole food plant-based diet for that matter is, you know, is one of the main uh, is one of the main reasons why people, um, the people who aren't vegan for health actually go vegan or, you know, can reverse lifestyle disorders. So the country did uh, start acknowledging it. And the effects of that I see today, because when I'm invited for talks, uh, you know, uh, or something with the government or uh, talks with other industry bodies, we realized that 
they are talking about this was not the narrative before this was not the attitude before these were not the questions that was ever asked before you know um so it was always taken as a niche but now yeah. i realize how they are acknowledging the fact how uh, one uh, being vegan is so important for sustainability um, and second is that how it can play a role in preventive health care so okay. overall i feel that covid has really uh, highlighted both these aspects sustainability and uh, preventive health care and um, of course there are some people who are sensitive to animal cruelty but i think um, i think that is just the younger generation you know, they like to call it what it is they yeah. are not apologetic in calling veganism as veganism and uh, you know masking it as plant based just to sound cooler they want to know what it is right so i think um, so i think that is gen z <laughs> uh, that's not really covid um, and that's amazing cuz it's a, vegan brands can literally thrive on that you know so um, but to the older generation or so somebody who's millennials you know you you talk about sustainability uh, here in india you get people receptive Yep, yep. And and thank you so much so much for all of those insights, you know. And obviously India is a very young country. Um, you know, when you look at the demographic profile of uh that part of the world versus uh, you know, a aging population even China when you look at their, you know, demographic profile, they seem to be aging um, you know, far faster than originally, you know, thought and and uh, uh birth rates have gone down and so on. Well, Here's the other thing. You mentioned that now people are inviting and government bodies are more open and um you were recently speaking uh, at the Associated Chambers of Commerce uh, I hear you know Asocham invited you to share your thoughts about you know veganism and preventative healthcare and, and so on other things. Uh but you know uh one fine morning I wake up and I I saw one of your uh posts around vegans actually going to be a one of the product labels in india you know and and that i'm just going to pull it up on our screen that the indian regulator um has actually prepared first ever rules for vegan food um fssai stands for food safety and standards authority of india and palak it sounds as though you had a role to play so tell us how did you manage that I I was just invited to be a part of the task force which created the guidelines and it is not law yet it's going to be law soon yes. so right now they've just taken out the gazette and they've just opened it for public opinion and uh, they've got a lot of inputs by industry bodies um, but they do propose to make it law and uh, the I think I think it's just uh, I've been praying for this since seven years, Nizi. So I have, but I, I can tell you honestly, it's been it's been one of my deepest wishes. But I did not really contact anybody or try to do it. A lot of people, in fact, in the past have reached out to us throughout this through throughout these years and asked us to launch a vegan symbol or logo. It just never felt right, you know. Something like that has to be acknowledged by the government. Um, yeah. And I remember, you know. Uh, during the first uh, vegan india conference i was talking to dr sisyanto um, the chairman of world vegan organization uh, who's from indonesia and he was talking about the laws and rules there and how they have the symbol or how the government body is involved there so it was really wishful thinking it was like okay when can it happen in india i had started researching on it early on around like 3 4 years ago already with and i was in talks with him but a little bit, but it came out to be a surprise to me as well i think it's because um, see the industry is growing um, and i feel that as indians you know we see i in india we are underplaying uh, veganism because um, veganism is latent knowledge to us right gandhi was um, pro ahimsa right we already know what vegetarianism is and when she start explaining ethical vegetarianism uh, ethical vegetarians in india what vegetarianism means it's really obvious it's vegan right so yeah. uh, so here in india i think veganism literally needs no introduction we just need to remind ourselves and i feel that um having knowing the cultural sensitivities of the population um uh, you know maybe the government might have um, acknowledged that because it is a growing industry more and more brands are coming out with vegan products 
and you know we have gens in india we have so many people who have who follow sattvic lifestyle so imagine you know we have a green dot and a red dot but imagine people who have same cultural values but don't take certain animal substances yeah. so um i'm not really sure about the intentions uh, you know by them but i feel that it's just the overall growth we are seeing and uh, my best guess is the same that you know i feel that um, and that's how i like to introduce veganism to india that guys this is nothing alien <laughs> you, you know in fact i feel that you know we in have been one of the pioneers of ahimsa uh, the movement and even for that matter veganism because sattvic foods is so close to our uh, our life right another thing too so i think that 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 is what happened um talking about sattvic foods nidhi nidhi have you noticed that you know back in the day now during our grandfather's time people used to have a uh, food but they never had so much milk and so much dairy then okay. in fact we didn't even have the culture of cheese right it was yeah. brought to us by the british yeah. and uh, yeah so before that and when, before that i feel people used to have milk but mostly for medicinal purposes or something like that we never had mi- uh, milk 24/7 or milk solids in every little product so largely we have always been dairy free and actually animal product free so yeah. um Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, uh, the National Dairy Development Corporation of India wasn't launched until 1965, and uh, one of the big um, impetuses, you know, uh, that was provided to the Indian dairy industry as it stands at this point in time, one of the largest industries in the world, actually, because India is the largest exporter and you know domestic producer of dairy. unfortunately we we were never that and um as you rightly pointed out it is part of the colonial legacy one of the negative aspects of the colonial legacy uh that we you know having to contend with um and and what i understand from you know research that i've done is uh that the first livestock census happened in um you know the In, in the early 1900s in india 1924 it was organized by the uh, then you know british government and uh they were the first to basically you know really talk about how the local the native indian cows their milk wasn't good enough for the tea that the british soldiers and and their families that were deployed in india at the time needed because even the chai culture so to speak isn't native to india you know india did not grow tea we didn't grow sugarcane uh, you know in the, to the extent that we grow at this point in time um and definitely you know indian dairy cows just weren't fertile enough to be producing higher milk yields so this whole artificial insemination programs and so on that we see uh, you know that started um and, and became like a really large cooperative movement in india it didn't even start um you know until the the british basically saw this as an opportunity or as a gap in in the indian economy that they you know felt that was needed to be fulfilled um and and it's a uh, pretty industry uh, interesting that they actually started with defense dairy farms and so the first ever dairy farms in india were defense dairy farms and it's it's really um you know insightful for you know people who don't know this that actually some of those defense dairy farms still continue to exist um and they were the first uh, ones that started the artificial insemination and uh, injecting yeah. hormones and and so on and then in the 1960s after the first indian you know international conflict with china i, I believe there was a war between the two countries um that indian soldiers needed protein and you know beef was off limits because of vegetarianism um chicken was off limits and so on so the indian government basically felt dried milk powder was the way to actually get that protein to them and and that's how uh you know the anand experiment and so on received the sort of boost that it did but but anyway you're absolutely right uh veganism is not new to india we've been practicing that for years um share with us a little bit around you know you've heard these words like sattvic foods that you mentioned and vedic nutrition and um you know shakahari i mean when you use that's the word in in india in in, in hindi and in a slew of other um indian languages 
for vegetarianism, but then it's not necessarily lacto-vegetarianism, right? Because the word shakahari literally means plant-based. It's like somebody who eat, eats plants. So, yeah. so when you, as a vegan, um, you know, entrepreneur, vegan social entrepreneur in India, um, talk about veganism, how do you navigate it with, you know, people? Um, what are some of the words? What is the vocabulary that you believe works for them? Because vegan is once again, it's, it's, you know, there is British heritage involved with that too. I mean, it, they, they came up with the word uh, in 1940s, I believe. So how, how do you talk about it? Or do people get it when, when you say vegan? Actually, a lot of people do get it. And um, I don't think there's a problem in calling it vegan at all. I think uh, it's, it's good to have that demarcation. Um, yeah, I do uh, a lot of times take the reference back and saying that, you know, try to understand that vegetarian purely means vegan in its purest form. So, um, but people are quite receptive to it and people, but you know, India is a large country. You know, we have uh, most of the population is not still literate and, you know, they are still in two dire cities. So I am talking largely about urban Indians only right now. I'm not talking about uh, Indians who are in villages. And that is honestly a different tack problem to tackle altogether. Um, I do feel that how we can influence uh, you know, those people are by... Um, just I think it, it could start with farmers directly right so people who are in uh, rural areas uh, you know who have slaughterhouses or who have these big uh, you know animal farms I think uh, they just need to be given more subsidies to grow uh, plants and vegetables and do that right instead and uh, you know then get introduced to the subject of veganism this is yeah. for the rural areas and um, People are quite open. In urban India, uh, veganism is getting a lot of receptivity, uh, but so are keto, keto diets, gluten-free diets. So I think uh, today, you know, we are living in a global culture and there is so much rapid digitalization in India that and a lot of urban Indians are very well-traveled. Um, you will find some of the most, uh, like, some of the biggest billionaires here in India. So there is a lot of wealth also that is there in the country. So given the fact that, you know, we are able to afford certain products um, and they are well-traveled and millennials do go out a lot, uh, everybody's on the internet. So I feel that veganism is not something which is alien to us anymore. Of course, when you go to countries like Kashmir, maybe, you know, where largely people don't even eat vegetables, they literally only eat meat. Um, that's, that's, those are places where veganism is still really mocked at. But if you look at the, you know, one-tire cities like Delhi, Bangalore, or even uh, cities like Pune, Chennai, uh, pretty uh, receptivity is higher now. Um, so for older people, because of whole food plant-based and, you know, the preventive healthcare, and for youngsters, mostly for uh, animals or climate change. So I think that's how it's been till now. And people are receptive. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing that. And, and, you know, one of the things that our viewers might not understand about India is that India is, uh, you know, multiple countries folded into one. So every region, every state has its own cuisine. So, you know, like Punjab, which is a state that, you know, both uh, Palak and I uh, hail from, you know, uh, has its own Punjabi cuisine. You referred to the state of Kashmir. They have their own Kashmiri cuisine, which is, uh, you know, Pre predominantly uh, uses a lot of meat and, um, you know, animal products, uh, unfortunately. And, and then there are some other, you know, states as well that have, uh, it's, it's a multi-regional cuisine country. So obviously talking about veganism, you've got to take just so many different cuts, you know, at it, right? It, it's a very yeah. complex beast uh, that, that India is uh, and, and has always been. So there's the urban uh, there's urban India, there's an, there's the middle class India that, you know, everyone talks about that upholds these values of pious vegetarianism and worships the cow and, and, and so on. Um, give us I, mean, yours. I, I know, but sorry for cutting you short. So I, I completely get where you're coming from, but you know, we are very clear in our approach and we talk about everything, but at the end of the day, for us, it comes down to animals. Okay. And that is why, I, I mean, you know, remember in our early days when we were asked to rename ourselves as health first, it would have been so much easier, but we didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, and I feel that that is for a reason.
I genuinely, intuitively, and I'm being com- completely true right now, I have always felt it that there will be a time where we will, vegans will not be mocked at, where it will not be a niche. And instead of all this energy that we're putting into masking this, you know, if we just put the same energy back to just, you know, calling, saying it for what it truly is, you know, um, you will see a huge change. Gandhi didn't go and say that, hey, Ahimsa is not so popular, so let me like rephrase it and call it something else, you know, just did the right thing. So yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's what's happening. So in India, definitely, it's important to talk to different cultures in different ways. But um, for us, what works most is, you know, for just talking about that you can't kill sentient beings and you just can't. You have evolved, you know, uh, you're on your computers and your iPods, uh, you know, and your laptops and everything now. Um, but your food habits have not. So we just say it as it is. And I feel that, you know, across all countries i genuinely feel that this should be the norm yeah absolutely you know saying it like it is and and calling the spade a spade and saying that well do it for the animals because why would you want to have you know murder on your hands literally because that's exactly what it is um to do anything else um you've been speaking at um international you know, veg fests as well. So you had a recent talk at the veg fest in Morocco um, and uh, you have an upcoming endeavor, which is called the Himalayan Vegan Festival as well. So so tell us a little bit about these, uh, you know, international experiences that you've had and, and some insights around, uh, you know, how uh, your sort of being an, uh, a veritable ambassador for India uh, and on the international vegan scene. Thanks, Nivi. I think that, you know, um, what is really important is, and that's what we've realized in our journey, is that um, value systems across human beings are largely the same. <laughs> you know, most people are compassionate. So it was super easy to connect with anybody compassionate at any corner in the world, you know, be it in India or Antarctica or Africa. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's been that's that's been one biggest uh, I think uh, backbone of the movement rather, right? Um, so that was when we we decided, hey, and I think it was when uh, the World Vegan Organization, you know, uh, approached us back in two thousand nineteen, mm-hmm. and we had intended to do a conference. They had intended to do it, and they said, hey, let's just partner and do this together. That was the first time, you know, uh, we opened our gateways to the international audience. We always wanted to do it, but in the beginning, in the early years, we were like, hey, let's just put the focus here in India. Um, So now I think we are in a capacity and gradually we will be, um, you know, talking and doing way more outreach globally and not just focus to India. As far as Africa is concerned, it is, you know, they have all my heart. I think, uh, you know, the organizers of the Best Fest Morocco have done an amazing job. And I got to learn so much about what's happening there. And uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a country which is really underserved. And we are going to be, um, you know, now covering news about Africa proactively as well. We have some ambassadors there. Um, and uh, we have a Vegan First Ambassador program where you can represent, uh, you know, yourself from different mm-hmm. countries. And we do plan to also uh, have discussions with, I mean, uh, maybe support incubations and uh, other people to invest in countries like Africa, because I feel that, you know, as far as the talent is concerned or the population is concerned or the agricultural capacity is concerned, they can actually create phenomenal things which can, uh, you know, be large uh, exporters for other countries. But then um, in Africa also, you know, it's it's how India was perhaps, uh, say, three or two, five years ago. So I feel that they will suddenly see a rise. And um, because they, they still have this latent knowledge, they're culturally in the early years, they only used to not have so much meat. It was only yeah. when money started coming in that they glorify, started glorifying meat. But they said, hey, beans, proteins, pulses, this, I mean, beans and pulses, it's all we always use for uh, protein. And, you know, our grandparents are the healthiest. So I think that was really insightful for me as well. So, and um, 
So yeah, I think a lot of movement. Our focus as vegan first is definitely on the countries which are underserved, and we're also looking at Indonesia. We're also looking at Southeast Asia, and um, I'm really excited about Nepal. It's been organized by Zach Lovers, who is the founder of Veg Voyages, and um, the whole uh, WBO team in Nepal. And of course, we are also partner organizers, so we are curating the whole B2B sector with them. Um, and um, it's uh, it's it's just lovely to see how they're so focused on outreach that they're targeting only Bhutan and Nepal and creating awareness. In fact, um, I will share. I don't have it handy yet, but uh, one of one, Krishna Krishna Goring has uh, sung one of the most amazing songs on veganism, which is wow. shared. Uh, yeah, which is which is featured as a full blast video music video with a really nice. Uh, yeah, and it's released on a big Nepali digital platform. So I do see very strong seeds sprouting up in these communities. And um, we obviously are very proactive in that space because when we did the Vegan India conference in 2019, uh, that is when we realized we got a lot of audience from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal. And these were our sister countries, you know, where the movement was just starting up at an early stage and they wanted to talk to somebody. And I think that together, you know, we can do a lot more. Absolutely. And, and, you know, um, kudos to your efforts, you know, so once you, as they say, uh, uh, you build it and they'll come, right? So once you build it, and, and you've started building this uh, portal for so many years, you're starting to see that people reaching out to you from, you know, not just India, but outside, and, and as you said, our sister countries like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and, you know, um, Nepal and Bhutan uh, as well. The Himalayan Vegan Festival seems like, you know, a fantastic event. Please be there. Please be there next yeah, year. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I'm just trying to understand when is it going to be and if uh, Omicron doesn't upset the party, you know, that's going to be uh, they there. Are, they're deciding. So they have a plan B, you know, if Omicron doesn't upset everything, then they'll go ahead with April. Otherwise, they might shift the dates. But okay. the intention is there and they're expecting a huge crowd of, say, 5,000 people. But again, I think, yeah, we're just waiting for COVID to get over, honestly. <laughs> I know we're all, aren't we all, right? We all yeah. want the pandemic to finish. At this point in time, we're done with it. But, you know, shifting gears a little bit, um, uh, you, you're you an entrepreneur, right? And, and uh, there are just so many... Um, women and you know other uh, you know persons who do not necessarily identify as women who are wanting to get into the vegan entrepreneurship space and um and, and you've mentioned that you're partnering with uh veg voyages helping with the b2b connections and which is business to business connections um and and sort of promoting all of that uh, as well what do you think as an entrepreneur yourself is the most important step in entrepreneurship i think um i think you i mean it depends on, from person to person but for me the fundamental is you know my why if i know why i'm doing something uh then i can go all the way so uh it was very important for me to know why i'm doing what i'm doing i don't want to be just doing something which is cool or because um because I have, you know, some time to kill or maybe because I want to be known as an entrepreneur. Um, I don't want to be known as an entrepreneur. I never, I, I never cared about it. But I think uh, what was more exciting to me was, uh, you know, uh, why I should be give, giving significant amount of my time and energy to something. And then I, it prepares you for failure. It prepares you for success. It prepares you for everything. Uh, you know, your um, the fundamentals of entrepreneurship and even social entrepreneurship, right, should be that. Um, your balance sheets, the market opportunities, uh, you know, your MVP, then your positioning or uh, your business model, it's figure outable, guys. It can change, it can evolve, but what will carry you further will be your why, right? So, um, say, for instance, we want to create awareness about veganism, right? Say, Vegan First doesn't work out, you know, this publication just fails, you know, for instance. Um, I won't really care so much. I mean, I would care, I would be devastated, but <laughs> after a point, I will not. Not because I, I will try to see another opportunity where I can grow the vegan movement because my why is really focused and it's really yeah. clear. So I think if you have that in any industry, you know, be it um, an automobile industry or be it uh, your vision statement should not be something which limits you. It should be something which resonates with your heartbeat. Yeah. You know, so yeah, like Monji says, his 
his vision is adding value to people and to earth like i want to add value more i want to give back more than what i have taken in my life so if you know the mechanics you you know you're easily you're flexible so and especially in this time <laughs> that we live in it's such a dynamic such a challenging time entrepreneurship anyway is super difficult so um you know uh, you have to be able to be flexible you have to flow like water and then what takes you forward and if you just rely on accountants or investors or business plans or you you start doubting your own capabilities you know sometimes maybe you have done everything perfectly right everything you've done right and the odds just didn't work in your favor look at covid classic example but if you if your purpose was clear you would be able to navigate you know so i think um, any form of entrepreneurship is just really important to know your why and keep moving and evolving year after year it could turn out to be something else completely but as long as you're true to your vision and your purpose you will still have added value you would yeah. still have had a very fulfilled contented life yeah yeah beautiful thoughts there palak thank you so much for sharing and um you're absolutely right starting with your why and understanding why you're doing something what is your purpose what is something that resonates as you said with your heart you know uh and and that kind of gumption and and conviction is what we need um especially during a pandemic um initially you know when you were talking you were talking you were mentioning um you were a sculptor you're an artist and and you were teaching in a school and so what what kind of teaching were you doing were you teaching young kids or or were you teaching adults how to you know sculpt and uh, yeah yeah so um I was a fine artist. I was teaching fine arts itself, and I have taught all age groups. Uh, I was specializing in grade ten uh, board exams, CBSE, ICSC for fine arts. But um, over the course of my short teaching career, I have had all types of students of all ages, um, and. Um, Yeah, I did enjoy uh, you know the adults more, <laughs> way more because you know you could really go. I mean, I love children genuinely. I just find so much peace and comfort around them. You know, uh, so I do miss uh, younger students also. Some of the best, in fact, you know, more than teaching them, I used to learn from them. Yeah. Because they're so flexible. They live in the present moment. You give them a theme, they come up with something crazy, and I realize. i'm supposed to be the creative one you know here so i think uh, that's yeah. what i really enjoy with uh, children and i i do miss that but uh, whenever i i find children around me i just start playing with them so um but the teaching teaching is you know it actually happened to me i was on my terrace and i used to sketch we, we as artists we you, you had to are uh, you know when bodybuilders you have to do weightlifting on daily basis right or as athletes you have to run as artists we just had to sketch that that was our practice so i was on my terrace sketching one day and there was a, a special child um, you know peeping into my balcony from next door and she used to come every morning and just peep into the the, the terrace and then she used to see me sketch and then one day her mother came over to my house knocked on my door and said you will Uh, teach my child uh, how to how to sketch she doesn't talk to anybody she's uh, you know a little challenged that way and um, and i i rejected it i said i don't i don't teach and i don't have the time or the inclination or the interest so i was just in college at the time i was myself a student so i just said no then she literally blackmailed me you know she was like no no she doesn't talk to anybody she doesn't connect to anybody else you have to do it and i i was just you know sometimes i I struggled to say no to things, and I, I, you know, caved into it, and I said, "All right," and then that's the process. Uh, then it never stopped. Yeah, and how do you talk to uh, children about veganism if you do? It's it's the easiest to talk to children. Really, tell us. Yeah. in the whole planet, I think if there is somebody who is receptive to veganism, it's actually children. nothing you just have to tell them for what it is you just have to say hey if i if i tie you up and if i force you know to take something from you would you like it children are so much more empathetic in an instant i can't tell you how many children and you know the, the uh, i have met children at family weddings and i've just had a simple conversation with them over tea when everybody is running and dancing and all that and they remember and they come back after 6 months they will come and talk to me about the same thing the impact with children whereas if you the same conversation if you had with an adult 
you know, the next morning they've forgotten about everything. They don't even care. They're insensitive and probably they'll end up making fun of you, you know. So um, children, I think it's the easiest to, uh, you know, talk. All you have to do because they already are very pure. They have a high level of conscience. And that's all you have to say that, you know, at the end of the day, if you will not want to do this to yourself, and it's not really about veganism, honestly, in a way, it's anybody, right? Um, be it exploiting a man or a woman or a tree or a plant or an animal, you know, I think that's what we really need to lead by example as far as children is concerned. And it's not always easy um, because sometimes we do get angry or we do get impulsive. But if as much as possible, if you can lead by example, children just absorb that themselves. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I don't feel that we should just make veganism into a, you know, for the lack of a better word, cult and say, hey, you have to go vegan. We need to just tell them that, look, as responsible citizens or as, um, you know, somebody who is sen like as a human being, you just need to be sensitive to all life. Yeah. Not just animals for that matter, but human lives and, um, you know, you know, you should not see a difference between a girl or a boy or for that matter, you know, a plant or a food and just be grateful. So um, I think that if we can have that holistic conversation with children, um, because even a lot of vegans themselves, you know, are really lost because all we do is fight about veganism, how to promote it, right? So I think that if we can just present a more holistic um, point of view to uh, children, then we are looking at a stable generation. Right. And and you um, mentioned a really important point. It's It's the importance of acknowledging the intersectionality of the movement. You know, there are just so many overlaps. Uh, you've mentioned, um, you know, just the sheer humanity. Yeah. Of, right. It, it's not, It's it, well, for lack of a better word, you use the word veganism because you've got to use a word to describe a, a yeah. way of life. But then in the end, it, uh, it it's rolled into you know, uh, on into itself, just so many other things like women's empowerment, you know, uh, sentient rights, women's rights, because when you look at um, most of these sentient beings that are being exploited are mother cows and, and their mother hens and, and they're, you know, so it's sort of inseparably woven into that feminine, um, you know, acknowledging the divine feminine, you know, of the planet and the biome. Uh, you've spoken about how innocent children are and they haven't yet developed those layers of social conditioning. And labels, labels of boxing themselves. I am a vegan. I am a feminist. I am, I'm just a human being, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 And, and that seems to be a liberating way to approach it yeah you know because um uh, i i'm just i was so shocked when vegans fight with each other um you know i have very strong spiritual beliefs but i agree to disagree and i really respect somebody who's an atheist because we all are humans first you know so i don't for me it doesn't even matter you know but this these are the little and very petty things that we judge people on uh, you know uh, and i think uh, that is what's the whole point of you know promoting goodness if you it just backfires right and labels i am never been a fan of labels that's why i said like you know you you're calling me an entrepreneur but for the sake of a word i have to call myself but hey i've also directed films i'm also an artist maybe i'm none of that so how we box ourselves you know and that gives us an identity and more pressure to live live up to and um in the end we don't we can't agree to disagree and respect another's opinion you know um so i think uh if we really want a strong generation we want them like really away from all this load of crap all right okay well thank you so much for that really um energetic optimistic empowering conversation Palak. you know um in in the end if there was a message that you had for you know not just vegans but also non-vegans out there who are potentially watching this and and who are maybe sitting on the fence who haven't taken the plunge yet and they're yet to make arguably what you and i know is probably the most important decision of their life you know what to fuel yourself with what would that message be i would say that you know be be true to yourself uh, go within um understand take time to understand 
um, and once you do, but um, we are living in a time where me and mine does not work anymore. No, me and mine just do not. And our food choices are very closely related to that. Uh, if we are still, if we are still unsustainable in our thinking, if we are not looking at uh, a circular economy, if we are not looking at vegan foods, it's no longer really a taboo. But as a planet, we have come to a point where um, this whole me and mine philosophy will not work. So we all in our own ways, uh, including me, by the way, I'm still very much on the journey and I have made a lot of mistakes and I'm still learning and growing every day. But that's what, you know, really fuels me. It works for me. I hope it works for you, um, you know, because uh, being vegan is not enough. Um, you be vegan, then you level up, you realize, all right, not me and mine. Then you level up again and you realize what else can I do? Then you really level up and you realize, Hey, I'm just a vegan. I'm sitting in a city, but I'm not actually growing and planting trees. I'm not really helping the earth. So, you know, there's a lot of work for us as humanity to do, do in general. So um, being vegan does not make you any superior, you know. Uh, I think uh, approach it from a more holistic point of view. And then you realize that it's just a journey of becoming better. And that holds true for all of us. So if you can, we all can embark on that journey, you know, hold hands and uh, keep evolving. It'll be great. And there's a lot of supports. There are fantastic vegan alternatives available. It's never been easier, honestly. And the planet needs you. You know, the animals yeah. need you. So yeah. But look, thank you so much for being with us today. And it's been a pleasure. It always is a pleasure to interact with you, to talk to you, and to hear such amazing wisdom and, and with such great, you know, delivered with such great energy. I, I always walk away so rejuvenated. Thank you so much for being with us. And here's the message. Go vegan first. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Livy. It's a, such a pleasure to having uh, you know to talk to you always. You have the most amazing open heart, and uh, thanks once again. Thank you, and uh, to all our viewers, we will see you um, another time, another month, and with yet another brilliant episode with yet another vegan. All right, you take care, and we'll see you next time.